Good afternoon. I'm Dan Rundy. I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS. We're having a conversation, an exit interview with my friend, Ms. Henrietta Four. She's the seventh executive director of UNICEF. She's had a fabulous career in international development and humanitarian affairs. Uh, and she's been a real pioneer. She was the first woman administrator of USAID. Uh, and she was a real pathbreaker in her career. She's still got a lot of contributing to do. Uh, she happens to be a board member of CSIS and is someone who's been a longtime friend and colleague and mentor to me. So I'm really, really glad to have you here, Ms. Four. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be with you. So you just finished being the head of UNICEF during COVID-19. You've, um, there have been a number of challenges. Tell us a little bit about what is UNICEF and why is it important? Because it's a really important UN agency. And tell us about some of the challenges and some of the successes that you had at UNICEF. Well, Dan, um, it's a big question. Uh, but UNICEF is important for many reasons. It looks after all of the children in the world, and that means anyone who's 18 and under. It's a large population. It's in every country in the world. So UNICEF serves in every country in the world. Its budget is about $8 billion a year. We have to raise that amount each year. About two thirds comes from governments and they are also on our board of directors. So there is a strong governance system within the United Nations. And about and the other third is private. So it can come from corporations, it can come from individuals, and it can come from school children. There have been lots of drives for UNICEF so that children in America and in other countries learn about UNICEF early on, and they learn about the work in education, in health, in um, security, thus to keep children safe, in water and sanitation, and on nutrition. All the things that make a child's life um, healthy and well and something that they can thrive later on in life. So UNICEF is a very important um, agency. But <laughs> If you, if you want some, some areas that we've been focusing on, would that be good, Dan? Yes, please. All right. So um, in the last few years, uh, we felt that there were uh, a number of things going on in our world that needed attention. Uh, one was we needed vaccines so that we could save the lives of children. We needed to be sure that there was education so that we could save their futures. We needed to have clean water systems so that we could help communities, that they could be safe, let's say in a pandemic. And we needed to be sure that we focused on mental health. It was a new and a growing field, but it was to help families and to keep them together. In addition, it was very clear that we needed to focus on girls and their education. Uh, often girls are left behind in the educational um, systems in their societies and that would not be good enough for the world to come. We also had a number of challenges internally, so I would also say that there was a, an event and a initiative in which we focused on what our work culture was like within UNICEF. UNICEF is about 20,000 strong, but it's very important that you respect every individual. Mm. They come from countries all over the world, with so many religions and ethnicities and ways of thinking. And if you can blend them together, you become a stronger agency. And we did that. And that's an important lesson during a pandemic or at any time when you look at these large institutions. So those were important initiatives and each one had an importance on its own. The vaccines, because we move about half the vaccines in the world, often through private sector partners who can help us move them, fly them across the countries. Airspaces were closed. We needed to move an additional two billion vaccines once they were out into the world for COVID. But that is an enormous responsibility. It is a supply chain. It is like our equivalent of a D-Day. But to try to get vaccines to every country and to every child anywhere in the world. The second area for education we have about half of the world that is connected online. So how do you get uh, education to children when schools are closed? We had 1.8 billion children outside of school, 
And so how do they get an education? Teachers had gone home to look after their own families. There weren't ways to have remote education. Textbooks were in short supply. Devices, often a family would only have one mobile phone and that was how the children were supposed to do their homework. It's very hard because their parents needed their phones for work and for survival. So education became a very important sector and it's one that we've really done a lot of work on in UNICEF and has been our number one priority. Water, in addition, is one that you often don't hear about with UNICEF, but it goes with food. You will sooner die of lack of water than you will lack of food. So if you don't have clean water systems and potable water, then you have cholera, like in Yemen. Uh, water tables throughout the world have gone lower. That's not um, uh, an issue that can be solved simply. It needs infrastructure, it needs funding, it needs real attention. But if you have water, then it means that you'll have water in hospitals, you'll have water in schools so that children can wash their hands, you'll have water in villages so that families can cook their evening meal. So all of that's very important in water. And mental health, it's very clear that young today are saying they want we, their elders, yeah. to speak about mental health. We kind of hid it. Yeah. We didn't want to report it to anybody. We, we were afraid to. We thought we'd lose our jobs, uh, we'd lose our friends, our family. But young people want to talk about it, and they're right. And, and COVID-19 has made it worse. Absolutely. And it worse in family homes, but also online. The amount of bullying and mm. predators online is something you never want to see. So mental health is important for the world. And then having respectful workplaces is something all of us need to create. So they were initiatives at UNICEF, something I think we're all proud of in UNICEF. And we did it as a team, and we did it internationally. It's fabulous. I'm thinking about vaccines, and I don't think if you, when you think about UNICEF, people don't realize that you, you're really one of the main engines of delivering vaccines in the world. Where are we? We still have a lot of work still to do on COVID-19 in terms of getting people vaccinated. Is that true? We do, and it's partially because the vaccines tend to be. Um, gathered in the developed world and they don't come out to the developing world. But entities like um, Gavi and WHO and CEPI, we all gathered to create an accelerator, an ACT A accelerator and COVAX. And so once that was created. You were one of the, the for, you helped found COVAX. Correct. So UNICEF is a very strong part of this and we're the procurement center for vaccines. Wow. So it means that if we gather, let's say, 300 private companies who can help us deliver, we can deliver in the Pacific Island states. We can deliver all over the world. But you have to get approvals from governments. And um, so it's easier to move vaccines in the developed world than it is in the developing world. Plus, the developing world, as you know, there is a an enormous debt overload that you will see yeah. from the World Bank and from the international financial institutions. So there just isn't enough money for many of these ministries and um, prime ministers to allocate for vaccines. So we need donations from many of the wealthy countries in the world, both of product, but also of money so that we can bring vaccines in, that we can transport them once they are there, that there are refrigerators and ultra cold chain that we can move them into, that we can train the nurses and healthcare workers, and it's on a multiplicity of vaccines. I mean, Pfizer may be ultra cold chain, but some are not. And so a local healthcare worker needs to understand that. They need to understand the syringes that are used. I mean, the procurement just for syringes alone, single use syringes, Dan, is it's a major business opportunity, but it's a real challenge. So. It has to be a public-private partnership. I think the world understood that. But you need speed and you need scale if you're going to address a big issue like vaccinating the world. So, Ms. Four, tell us about um, girls' education. So we recently hosted an event uh, celebrating 50 years of Bangladesh's independence. And Bangladesh is a great success story. They invested in girls' education. If you compare the level of of uh, achievement of girls in school in Bangladesh to say Pakistan or India or any other country in South Asia, it's head and shoulders above any other country and it's had all sorts of 
economic benefits. It's had all sorts of social benefits for Bangladesh. Talk a little bit more about girls and, and girls' education, because you referenced it earlier. So, Dan, girls are essential for our world. I mean, um, if you give a girl an education, you open up every opportunity for her. But the payback, the reward, the return to the world is just enormous. And many cultures have not been as forward thinking as the Bangladeshi government. But they have been, and there's been a very strong emphasis on occupational education. One of the things we heard often at UNICEF was that the most wanted thing from young people around the world was a modern education, and I want to learn some livelihood. I want to make my way in the world. I don't think I'll get a job, so I've got to make a job. So if we can teach girls enough at school that they can have a livelihood, they become a very valuable economic partner in a country, in a family, um, anywhere in the world. And that's what we hope to do. But Bangladesh has also been very helpful in taking in the Rohingya. And the Rohingya uh, families wanted very much to have education for the children, uh, as most families do. Of course. But occupational education will be very important because few will go on into tertiary education and colleges. We're also seeing the digital online education is a pathway into the future, Dan. We have got to connect everyone to the internet. Girls do not have devices as often as boys. Mm. They're about half as likely to have a device that's at their disposal. So they're not learning or keeping up with their studies as often as they could. Now there is so much migration and refugees. And when you leave home, when you are displaced, either because of natural disaster or because of conflict, you often don't have something to take with you. If you can take a cell phone and a way to keep it charged, it's a great gift, but it's hard to keep up on your studies. But uh, there's some now some uh, partnerships with Microsoft, the learning passport, so that you can keep up with your home curriculum right. in your home language, and that's very important for girls. I 100% agree. I, I do think one of the takeaways from COVID was there's been more e-government, e-commerce, digital payments, and distance learning in the last 110 weeks than in the last 110 years. <laughs> so there's been lots of discussions about a digital transformation. We are in the middle of a digital transformation. The fact that this conversation that we're having, we have a live audience, but we have thousands of folks who are going to be watching this recorded, and also we have several hundred watching it live is that we're in the process of experiencing a digital transformation here. And so the digital divide that's in Moldova or Maryland or Mali or Malaysia, it's going to get closed one way or the other. I would like that the West, the OECD countries, play a big role in helping close that digital divide. It's in our enlightened self-interest. It absolutely is. And um, at UNICEF, we said, couldn't we connect every school in the world to the Internet? Couldn't we connect a great every question. learner? in the internet. We think we can now with lower satellites, with Wi-Fi, and with devices. But it will have to be a big public-private partnership. Uh, Generation Unlimited is one of the entities that's public and private that it was started to try to help that. But I think it's, um, it's a worthy goal for the world. And it will mean that every child then will have a level mm -hmm. playing field that they can start from. A lot of them are going to have to be entrepreneurs. Absolutely. So, Ms. Ford, in parts of the world, we're seeing global aging. So, in, in East Asia, here in North America, 10 years from now, most countries in the Western Hemisphere will be below replacement level. But in Sub-Saharan Africa and in parts of South Asia, we have an enormous, enormous youth bulge. And so, my sense is, is that you helped orient UNICEF to think more broadly about the concept of children to think about concepts of youth. And so could you talk a little bit about youth in 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 vis-a-vis -vis and how UNICEF plays a role in engaging youth in things like workforce workforce and training? So Dan, you're right that the demographics mean that we really have um, a change in the world, a change of the weight of where young people are, where future workers are, where future consumers are and where the um, intellectual and um, human drive will come from. 
and much of it is in what we consider the global south. So how do we then empower it to be smart and capable and confident and seeing a world that is the common good? Well, we think that um, education is part of it. It is the number one request that we have out of adolescence. Wow. So that age group between 10 and 24, they want to be digitally connected. They want to be online. They want to join the world. It's very easy when you're in an agency that is for children for people to think that they're very young children. Very young is extremely important to UNICEF. For, so those first three years to get the right nutrition into a child so that their brain grows appropriately, so that their bones develop, so that they um, form as a human being in a healthy way so that they can thrive. So nutrition in those early years has always been important to us. So was um, early education. Hmm. Early education is something that is done well in some of the countries in South America, like Argentina. Sure. Fantastic uh, example. Uh, Chile, very interesting. So you say to yourself, well, couldn't you do that around the world and engage parents in early childhood education? So they were known um, solutions to a young child's development. What we didn't realize was perhaps what happened in the development of an adolescent. There isn't enough research going on. How does the brain in an adolescent form? We know there's another, a second spurt of growth in a brain during the adolescent years. It's when the governance mechanisms come in. So how does that happen? What do we know about adolescents and how they think about the future, the effect of the digital life on their physical life? Many things we haven't known, but what they are asking for is they're asking for a, a way to become an entrepreneur, a way to learn something that's, that's in the future, that's, that means that they can shape their own futures. They want to learn what they want to learn, when they want to learn it. So let's say I want to learn to put up solar panels. I want to learn it on my cell phone, and I want to learn it after school. Nobody's going to teach me it in during secondary school. The dropout rates in sub-Saharan Africa for boys, they drop out in secondary school because they want to earn a living. They want to put up that solar panel. Sure. Or they get pulled off by a militia. For girls, it's that they get called into home either because there are aging parents and they need to do housework or it is because of early marriage. That's not good for um, many children and it is not good for the future of our world. Children need to be in school. They need to learn things. So if we can connect young people, particularly adolescents, this 10 to 24 year old, uh, they will become a powerful force for good in the world. So we started Generation Unlimited. We started a number of other programs. Um, there's one called You Reporters, where young people can report about their village. So they can report if there's a mudslide or there's a flood. Wow. They can get word out about what is COVID or what is Ebola so that they become part of their communities. They see that community help is useful. Maybe they'll want to become a teacher or a doctor or a nurse. We need more teachers and nurses. Absolutely. So if, if we also need farmers. So if, if young people can see that they're, they can make a future in their own villages, they will hopefully stay and improve their villages. If not, young people are drawn to the cities they want to be digital, they want to be online, and they want to get a job. And they end up in the urban slums that are around the cities because there are no jobs. Uh, they may not have a way of livelihood. Protection is very hard to keep them away from human trafficking and everything else. So adolescence on the move, it's happening from many of these countries in the south because it's a growing population. They don't see any jobs. They're not sure how they can make a job. So they head north, they head to somewhere else. So we've got to create opportunities in their homelands so that they'll want to stay home and that they'll want to make a future there. So Russia invaded Ukraine after you left running UNICEF, but I suspect you are watching what's happening in Ukraine very closely. How should we be thinking about the impact of what the Russia's war on Ukraine on young people? Well, um, once again, it's um, dashing hopes and dreams. It's very hard 
if you're a young person now in Ukraine or in some of the neighboring states, to think about what will your future be? How do you get a job? How do you make a job? You know, it's you, you had had one world, your village, your home, your community. Often now the homes are gone, the community is gone, people have fled in every direction. And this is something that's now happening in a number of countries. Syria, the amount of refugees and internally displaced people. Yemen, internally displaced. Terrible. Ethiopia. So it becomes very disorienting for a young person. And you realize that for those of us who are in the development world, whether we are a multilateral or a bilateral um, agency, rebuilding Ukraine will be central in our thinking. Can we do it? How do we do it? How can we help? But for many young Ukrainians, they will wonder if they should go back. So unless we can um, figure out ways to help Ukraine be a magnet to retain and bring back young Ukrainians, they will miss a whole generation of talent. I 100% agree with you. China has taken a larger role in the United Nations system. They've um, stepped up and, and, and taken on some burden-sharing roles. They've also put forth some very capable uh, potential candidates for leadership roles in the UN system. At one point, there were three, maybe four leadership posts run by folks from uh, mainland China. Could you talk a little bit about China's, China and China's role in the multilateral system from either where you sat or from where you sit now? So I think China has realized the importance of the multilateral system, uh, which is good. It's important that every country see it. And from the United States point of view, it's important that we also see its value so that we propose good candidates for the jobs and positions that are there. What the multilateral system gives one is um, a view into the world and what other people are thinking. You talk to everyone from every country. And as a result, you understand the political, military, economic, social systems within each country. So it is a way of understanding the world. And China has the ability to both see that world, participate in it, and influence it, just as every other country who is part of that multilateral system. And I, I think they've been seeing the value of that. It is also that if we want to build one world rather than a bifurcated world where there is a Western system and an Eastern system, then it's very important that we talk to each other and that we interlace and that we engage. So I hope that um, the United States will take it more seriously. I found that the role of UNICEF was an important one, both from how we spoke about human rights what our values, ideas, and ideals were. You can communicate them to the world if you run and participate in these agencies. And that's an important role for America. It's an important role for China, for all the countries of the world. I, I do think there's been a wake-up call here in Washington. Uh, there was a very important election for the leadership, the top role at the FAO, in, probably in 2017 or 2018. And um, mainland China put forward a very compelling and excellent candidate. And they won something like out of 180 votes, 115 votes. And the United States had a candidate, and that person got 12 votes. And I think that was a wake-up call here to say, wow, China has an ability to uh, put forward excellent candidates. They've got a compelling case. They've got a contribution to make. And then they also have the ability to deliver a significant number of votes. Maybe we should, we maybe have to rethink how we approach the multilateral system. I think that was a, there was a wake-up call, I think, in the Trump administration. Uh, I would actually argue it was potentially a healthy wake-up call in some ways. Let me just push a little bit further, though. I, I don't want to out some of my family members, but I think some of my family members still would say, well, what's this United Nations system and what's what's in it for the United States what's in it for us and you've made a little bit of a case earlier but could you just if you were talking to one of my skeptical family members about the multilateral system could you just make a little bit further case as to why the United States needs to be involved 
Um, so, so maybe I would focus that on three areas. One is power and influence. There is a chance to influence the thinking of countries around the world because you talk to them. It is a way to talk to them. It is a uh, environment, a convening environment, where your ideas and ideals, morals, your sense of what's right and wrong, of human rights, of planetary rights, that you can articulate it and that you can implement them. So the roles can be board members, the roles can be operating leaders such as myself, the roles can be people who work within these entities, but power and influence is definitely an important uh, part of our world. And you can see it whether you're in social media or if you're on television or in journalism. The second area is money and the future of economics. So the United Nations procures a lot of goods and services. There are a, a place like UNICEF will have 15,000 vendors of suppliers. So it is a very big supply chain that if you can enter with your companies, you can affect the goods and services that are being used in every country in the world. And thus you can often set the pace for what an electric plug looks like or what one eats or what one listens to or the artificial intelligence used in an education system. So getting into the donations, the investments, the business possibilities. The standard settings. Yes, very important part of the multilateral system. And then the third one I think that's very important is um, the United Nations and the multilateral system can bring understanding about other people's needs, desires, um, history. If you understand the people around you, you will better be able to make them friends or understand if you are going to disagree. But if you can disagree peacefully, if you can come to a negotiated solution rather than warfare where many civilians are killed, that would help. So we see now in Ukraine a school bombed or a hospital bombed. You would wish the world had moved beyond that. A place like um, the United Nations or the multilateral world can help bring that understanding that maybe there are other ways to talk about disagreements. Ms. Four, I also think you were the you were a former administrator of USAID. You worked at the State Department. You worked at the Treasury Department. Um, you've uh, been in the private sector. I would argue that we're in a post-post-Cold War world, that maybe the, the post-Cold War world of, from 1989 until maybe 2019, maybe we're in, a, we're in the beginning of a different era. Do we need to update how we think about diplomacy and development and defense in this new world? And if so, how, how, would, how should we think about that? We definitely do. <laughs> we need an update. It's, it's time to do it. We're, we're in the midst of some revolutions, some big revolutions in our world. It often happens at the beginnings of centuries or at the turn of centuries, and we're in it. I mean, as we've just been speaking, we're in a revolution for education. No question, we're going digital. We're in a revolution for health. We're going digital. <laughs> and um, uh, We're in a revolution for food and nutrition. No question. We're in a financial, the fintech world is in a big revolution. So when you have all of those revolutions that are just changing the world around you, we can't just sit on what we used to think was the right approach for development, for diplomacy, and for defense. They need updating to the world that is here now and the world that is to come. So as Henry Kissinger often says, think long term. You don't have to think 100 years out, but at least think 30 years out. Mm. Our world is moving so fast, and we have these revolutions all around us now. Well, take advantage of it. Let's, let's look at what public and private entities can do to help in defense, diplomacy, and development, because public-private partnerships are the way of the future. And we haven't thought that through well enough as the United States, but this is the time. I want to ask you about, are you optimistic about 
the future of democracy and human rights in the world. I mean, I think one of the issues that is that we're we're seeing is there's been some democratic backsliding in some parts of the world. There's been some 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 rights for for women and girls maybe haven't you know have there's been some backsliding there's been some significant progress there's been some backsliding technology was hoped to be maybe a, an enabler of democracy and in some ways it is and in some ways it's not could you could you just reflect a little bit about how how you think about the future of democracy and and human rights given given the various roles that you've had so i love people participating and I think it's what the young are telling us. I certainly heard it in UNICEF. They have a voice. It isn't that they want to get a voice. They have it. So we just have to listen to it. And how do we listen? Well, it's on social media. It's um, in all of the videos that mm. they are making. They're talking to us. And we, their elders, are maybe used to listening in different ways. Mm. But we're going to have to learn how to listen to them because this is their century. This is their turn. It's their time. And uh, if we can think forward on what they are going to want, need, count on us to give them and to help them with and partner with them, it will change the world. So democracy is very important in that. It gives voice. And I think that we will find that there will be stronger and stronger backing out of this young generation for democracies. But democracies have to deliver. Mm. They have to produce something for their people. If they do not, they will be tossed out. So, Dan, one of the areas that I think public sector can learn from the private sector is how to actually deliver, how to operationalize, how to make sure that you do what you say you're going to do, to walk the talk. And if we can learn to do that everywhere around the world in our democracies, then people will be with us. If they will not, voices will be everywhere. One of the things you often hear in the multilateral system is how important stability is. That most countries would like the world to be as it is. They don't want great upheavals. They don't want their young um, on the streets demonstrating. But that's what the young and what democracies bring if you don't respond to them. Human rights, I think, is a whole nother area that we're going to have to reconfigure and reconsider. Human rights are they're, they're rights that are conveyed either naturally by being born, the right to breathe, let's say. Others are conferred by governments, that they are um, the right to an education. And other rights are rights that you wish you had, like the right to a job, which you may have to earn in a different way, but it's an economic right. So human rights, natural rights, economic rights, who gives them, who creates them, is going to be, I think, a very interesting discussion, a productive discussion for the world. But we are, hopefully, going to have a good conversation about what human rights should be elemental. It's something we did at the beginning of the United Nations. Uh, there is um, a charter. A charter of human rights. There is a charter for children's rights. And they are all the things that we want as a world. Well, if we actually believe it, then we have to carry it out, each in our own way, at home, in our communities, in our foreign affairs. And it means that um, you do not bomb schools you do not bomb hospitals, that civilians should be allowed to be civilians and that you allow children to live their lives. And, but it's going to be a discussion in the world and it is one that we should have. But it's, um, it's a parallel discussion with democracy, but it is not the same discussion. Ms. Ford, thanks so much for being with us today. This was really, really great. Thanks so much for your service. I'm so glad you've agreed to rejoin the CSIS Board of Trustees. We're so happy to have you back here at CSIS. Good. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan.